We hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. It is time for announcements here at the Loma Linda University Church. And first off, this afternoon is our annual Heritage Singers concert right here in the sanctuary at 4.30. We encourage you to come early because seats do fill up fast. And next week, December the 2nd at 4.30 here in the sanctuary is our very own Loma Linda Academy musical program to start our holiday season. If you would like to come and support them, we would encourage you to do so. They always do a fabulous job. And then the next week, December 9, is our annual Candlelight Christmas Concert. That'll be at 5 p.m. in the sanctuary. We encourage you to buy your tickets now. They're not gonna be available at the door. There won't be will call, and there's only the one performance. So we encourage you to get your tickets as soon as possible. Go to our website at louc.org and you can find out more information there. We've been talking a lot about the pathway to health that is happening out in Phoenix, Arizona this Christmas, December the 25th through the 27th. I wanna invite you to come and join me and many other volunteers to help for this wonderful event that is sharing God's love through medical health as well as many other opportunities. If you would like more details, please check out our church website, click on the banner that says Pathway to Health. It will give you more details and you can register there. Now, if you would love to participate in putting up all the wonderful decorations that we have each and every year here in the sanctuary, Thad could use your help tomorrow at 11 a.m. For more information, if you look in the bulletin, and you can go online and look at the bulletin as well, you'll see a phone number and you can call him and ask him for more information. Otherwise, be here in the sanctuary at 11 a.m. If you have any questions regarding these announcements or you want to find an opportunity to get connected and involved here at the Loma Linda University Church, Check out your bulletin, our church app, the website, or please come out to the Uconnect Center in the foyer. We would love to talk with you. And with that, on behalf of the entire pastoral staff and all the staff that helps the worship services happen each and every week, hope you have a wonderful day.
Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. And welcome to the Loma Linda University Church on this special Thanksgiving weekend. I extend a warm and cordial welcome to each of you in the sanctuary today, as well as those of you who are watching on LLBN or on the church website. During this Thanksgiving season, we have so much to be thankful for, amen? Not the least of which are religious freedom, family and friends, and actually life itself. Personally, I am thankful for the mercies of God in my life during this past year. I'm also thankful for the opportunity of serving on the pastoral staff of this church in the capacity of nurturing, bereavement, and visitation ministries. Over the past few months, I've had the privilege of meeting many of you, but I look forward to getting to know more of you in the coming days, weeks, and months. You know, if time allowed this morning, I'm sure that each of you could come right where I'm standing and give your own testimony of how good God has been to each of you during this past year, to you and your family. But I'm sorry to say the time won't allow us to do that today. But I want you to do me a favor. I want you to turn to the, someone sitting near you. Just turn right now, turn to them, and repeat after me. Say, neighbor, during this past year, God has been better to me than I deserve. Oh, that sounds good. Someone say amen, amen. amen. Friends of mine, my prayer today is that each of you somewhere during this worship experience will receive that special blessing for which your soul thirsts. And I want you to remember this. God did not allow you to come to church this morning just to receive a blessing. Oh, no. But because you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, he has called you to be a blessing to someone as well, maybe through a smile, maybe through a word of encouragement, maybe through just listening to someone who's going through something today. Is that all right, saints? Amen. Friends of mine, the season of Thanksgiving is coming to a quick end. So let me encourage you to embrace a life of thanksgiving. A life of thanksgiving, that means living every day with an attitude of gratitude. Pastor Randy. Pastor Adrian, I'm just going to move out of the way and you just take over. No. <laughs> you're, you're, you're exciting us here. This is oh. wonderful. <laughs> what a delight it is to have all of my colleagues with us here on the staff, including Pastor Adrian. We're just delighted he's here and part of our team. And we're so pleased that you're here at this special time of the year. I want to add my voice to something that was said in the announcements just a few moments ago, and that is we are not just a congregation that enjoys the rich blessings of God. We're also a congregation that seeks to share the rich blessings of God. One of the wonderful ways that we can do that is this Christmas season by participating in Pathways to Health in Phoenix. Now, we've been talking about this over some weeks now. Do you know that they have not had hundreds, but thousands of volunteers sign up? It's going to be an exciting time in Phoenix to serve the underserved, underprivileged community. But there are still some specific needs. So Pathways to Phoenix still has these needs today. They still need seven optometrists. Now, we have some optometrists here in our midst, so they need seven optometrists. They need some ophthalmologists, some dentists, and certain surgical subspecialties such as ENT, dermatology, and urology. So if that describes you, any of those describe you, you can be a great blessing to somebody, in fact, to many somebodies this Christmas season. If none of those describe you, don't fret. There's still room for you because they need 300 people to help with setup and takedown on December 24 and 27. What a great way, Pastor Adrian, to Amen. serve others, to make a difference at this Christmas time. If you're interested in that, you can go on the website, our church website, or the Pathways to Health website, or stop at the Uconnect Center out in the lobby. Thank you so much for considering ways to serve God. We'll continue to serve Him faithfully in this community, but this is an unusual opportunity that we're partnering with. God bless you. Amen. Saints of God, in Psalms 100, David said, Enter his gates with thanksgiving, 
and his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Again, I say welcome and happy Sabbath. Please remain standing as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning we want to pause. We want to take a breath from our hectic, activity-filled lives to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for our healthy bodies, knowing that you are with us when we are sick. Thank you for the joyful moments knowing that your care extends when we are sad. Thank, thank you for the provisions of life, knowing that it is not what we have that defines us. And thank you for our family and friends, knowing they are constantly within your hand, even when life here on earth comes to an end. We have so much to be thankful for. And yet, too few times we say thank you. So this morning, we want to thank you, say thank you for being our God, our God of bountiful blessings, a God whose power never falters, whose patience never fades, whose love never ends. And so to you, our God, 
we cast our eyes. We take our eyes off of ourselves and look fully upon you and recognize that we are so blessed to have you as our Father, as our Abba, as our God. Amen. It is so good to be with you this morning. I don the brand new gloves and the belt, and I just want you to know I take a lot of heat for the newness of these. The guys who have dirty belts because they work so hard give me a bad time. They, so, they say, Pastor Mace, you know, it looks like you haven't done a day's work in your life. And I say, guilty. But we're about to. We're very excited about our building program. I wear this uh, belt and these gloves as a reminder that we're on a building program. And it's a fabulous, wonderful building. You've seen pictures. You're going to see more pictures. And we're very excited. We're very hopeful. We've learned our lesson in declaring dates prematurely. But it's safe to say it's in the new year. And we're very excited about your generosity. Friends, we have averaged over $80,000 a month since January through October. And I just praise the Lord for your generosity and your partnership in uh, combining our efforts to build and to set our bank full of giving and dollars before we get started. When you add our interest of $20,000, $23,000 a month, that's over 100000 a month that we're able to stock away and save. We're up to $10.6 million. That's before our giving season totals. You can see in your bulletin that the giving season total is $142,500. Friends, these are numbers designed to inspire you to get on board and to join us. This is not for a small term. This is the long haul. This is the long game, and we're in it together. And I want to say my heart is full this, this uh, Thanksgiving season, full of your generosity and your goodwill and your faith. It takes daring faith to build a building like this. Now, in the coming weeks, we hope that you will plan on a very special offering, December 16. We have set $1.2 million goal to be our goal, and we did it last year. We came so close. We were right at that point, and we hope that we can add that to our average throughout the year and yield about $2 million to contribute after this year. We did last year. $2.2 million we raised last year. Put that in the bank as we prepare to build. In the coming weeks, I'm going to have our head elder, Richard Bloom Johnston, join me, and we're going to interview stakeholders. Our first stakeholder will be Pastor Stu Hardy who runs a world-class media department. And for those of you at home who are enjoying our broadcast, that's brought to you by our media team. And we hope that you too will become stakeholders in this new building. Friends, we truly, truly build for his kingdom. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart in joining us on this endeavor.
That was beautiful. Thank you, Thai family. And like I said, for service, Jake, it's so good to have you home from college. All right, I want to invite all of the kids to come forward for the children's story. Where are you? Come on down. You can come. You're, you're, you're still young enough. Oh, wow. <laughs> We've got some uh, lively uh, kids up here. Come on down. All right can sit even right here in front, because I'm going to stay down here on the carpet. Wow, good looking crew. Yeah, yes. All right. Did everyone have a fabulous Thanksgiving? Yeah? How many of you had family come visit you? Yeah? All right, a few of you. How many of you are visiting? You don't go to this church, but you are visiting. Well, welcome. We're so glad to have you. It's wonderful. All right. I have a question to ask you, and I'm going to ask you to show your hands to answer, okay? How many of you have ever been really sick? Any of you ever been really sick? Oh, we've got, it is the blue zone. You start young. All right. Okay. A few more hands went up. Those of you that were really sick, how many of you had parents that said, you know what, you are so sick, you've got to get out of the house. Get out of the house until you're better. In fact, I want you to get out of the yard. I want you to go as far away as possible because we do not want to get sick. Any of, did this happen first? Is this the same little girl? <laughs> this happened first service. I'm sorry, you can come live with me as well. I'll let you stay in my house. <laughs> well, some of you are lucky, some not so lucky, it looks like. But a long time ago, far, far to the west of everywhere, there was a group of guys, of men. And guess what? These guys were super, super sick. In fact, they were so sick that their skin looked really different. And they had some deformities, too, because of this illness. And people did not want to be around them because, guess what? They scared them. Yeah, because they were sick. And so they not only felt physically sick, but guess what? Their hearts hurt, too, because no one wanted to be around them. They had a sickness called leprosy. How many of you know what leprosy is? A few of you know what leprosy is? It's a skin disease. And they often thought that it was contagious. And that's why they didn't want anyone to be around them. Because if they were to touch them, they thought maybe they could get the disease as well. And so they wanted them to stay far, far away. I want to show you a couple of pictures of people that have leprosy. It's not very fun. It's painful, too. Here's another picture. I know. We'll quickly speed through. All right. And there we go. So you can see it was not a fun thing to have at all. And so these men, guess what? It was the rules back then that these men had to stay far, far, far away. They couldn't go to church. If they had it, they couldn't go out into the public places. It was so sad. But they heard that this healer was coming to town, a really popular guy. Can anyone guess who that healer was? Who? Jesus. Yes, Jesus was coming to, down, to town, and they had heard many stories about him. And so as Jesus was coming through their village, guess what? Do you think they ran right up to him and said, Jesus, Jesus, help us? You think that? Well, that's a, good, that's a good guess. Actually, they had to stay far away because, remember, they had leprosy. So they yelled from far away, Jesus, please have mercy on us. And Jesus just looked at them, and he said just a few simple words. He said, go and show yourself to the priest. And they had to show themselves to the priest because the priest was the one who could say, look at them and say, oh, 
oh, okay, you're all better. You're clean. You can go back home. And so they headed off to see the priest. And guess what happened as they were walking and heading there? What do you think happened? What? How did you know? The leprosy went away. They looked at their arms, <gasps> their legs. They felt their face. And guess what? They were all healed. What would you do if you had leprosy and all of a sudden you were healed just like that? What would you do? Raise your hand. I would praise Jesus. You would praise Jesus. That's a really good idea. What would you do? That a party. Oh, and you would party. All right. <laughs> I like my kind of girl. Um, I would pray. You would pray? All right. What would you do? I would tell my classmates. You would tell your classmates. That is great. One more. What would you do, sweetie? I would be thankful. You would be thankful. Well, guess what these guys did? Remember, there were 10 of them. Nine of them kept going on their way, and only one, just one, went back to Jesus and threw himself down at Jesus' feet, and he said, thank you so much for healing me. He was the only one, one out of ten. Can you believe that? Are you, you can believe that. Are you thankful, boys and girls? Are you thankful people? Do you say thank you often? Who, I want to I wanna see a show of hands. Who got in their very own car and drove themselves by themselves to church today? Raise your hand. No one? Oh, okay. Right, that's believe. Where are your parents? <laughs> okay, nice, nice try. All right, who, I'm looking at some really pretty clothes here. Did you buy this dress all by yourself with your own money? Who bought it for you? My mom. Did you tell her thank you? Yes. Yeah. You told her thank you. Oh, good girl. Well, there are lots of things that we can't do our, for ourselves that other people do for us. And you know what? Saying thank you to your parents or a teacher or someone, guess what? That's a way of showing them respect showing them that they're valued and actually a gift back to them. So we need to remember every day to say thank you to the people around us. And Pastor Randy is going to talk to us today about being thankful. And as you do that, we have some uh, worksheets and activity booklet for you to do as you listen to Pastor Randy. So as they're getting ready to pass those out, I wanna practice this. Let's see how much you learned. What do you say when someone opens the door for you? Everyone together. Thank you. What do you say when someone shares their toy with you? Thank you. What do you say when Pastor Randy gives each of you $1,000 at Christmas? Thank you, Pastor Randy. <laughs> All right, get your activity booklet and you may go back to your seats. Have a good Sabbath. It is a very special Sabbath, one where we can be thankful for many things. Right now, I'm trying to relate to the Apostle Paul who says, be thankful in every circumstance because they forgot to warm the water this morning. <laughs> so, the Holy Spirit is here. Quickly, quickly now, I want to introduce you to a good friend of mine. This is, this is our pastor, our campus pastor. We call him the chaplain at Loma Linda Academy, Joe Cordero. And he is a dear friend to me and to all the pastors. He represents 
so many good things, the spirit of Jesus Christ at Loma Linda. And we just love what Joe represents to all of our kids down at the academy. We are honored that Joe is with us this morning. Thank you, Pastor Doug. Ashley and I have been studying scripture over this last year, and it's been my privilege to see her love in Jesus continue to increase as she un understands who Jesus is. And so it's been um, so amazing to be at this point now where Ashley is committing to a lifestyle of Jesus Christ. I, right now, I'd like to invite friends and family of Ashley to please stand. Ashley, you can see that this is your friends and family will continue to be here and support you in your journey with Jesus and to continue being with you at all times. Thank you. You may be seated. And so, Ashley, it has been my privilege to be studying alongside you this last year. And because of your love for Jesus and your belief in his death and resurrection for you, I now baptize you in the name of God, your creator, Jesus, your redeemer, and the spirit, your guide. Amen. Grizel has also been joining um, Ashley and I in our studies the, over this last year, and I've been so impressed of the curiosity that Grizel has in understanding who Jesus is. Her questions always come back the next week asking about, what does this mean, what does this mean, and I've been so impressed by that, and I encourage her never to stop asking questions. At this time, I invite friends and family of Grizel to please stand. Grizel, you can see that this your friends and family will continue to be here with you in your journey of understanding Jesus Christ. You may be seated. And so, Grizel, it is my privilege to be studying with you this last year, and because of your love for Jesus Christ and your belief in his death and resurrection for you, I now baptize you in the name of God, our Creator, Jesus, our Redeemer, and the Spirit, our Guy. Amen. Friends, we love partnering with those at our academy, and we appreciate any of the kids there at the academy who want to pursue baptism, and we offer the same to all of our members or visitors here. If you would like to pursue a journey with Jesus, come talk to us about baptism. We would love to speak with you.
Once again, we want to thank you for choosing to worship with us here at the Loma Linda University Church this first Sabbath right after Thanksgiving. Now, the holiday season for many of us is such a joyous, wonderful time with family, but also know sometimes it's a very difficult time. Whatever your situation, we hope that God's presence is especially close during this holiday season. Pastor Randy is doing a special sermon this Sabbath focused on the importance of being grateful to God. Now, before we return the service, let me read the following quotes. It is not how much we have, but how much we enjoy that makes happiness. No matter what our circumstances, we can find a reason to be thankful. In happy moments, praise God. In difficult moments, seek God. In quiet moments, worship God. In painful moments, trust God. In every moment, thank God. A spirit of thankfulness is one of the most distinctive marks of a Christian whose heart is attuned to the Lord. Thank God in the midst of trials and every persecution. Something to think about. Now let's rejoin the service. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We invite you to join us in a um, responsive reading. It is number 702 in your pew hymnal, or you can choose to follow along on the screens above. You can join me in reading the bold print. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Speak of all his wonders. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his wonders which he has done, his marvels and the judgments uttered by his mouth. O seed of Abraham, his servant. O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He has remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Well, it seems we just pushed away from the table and the meal is still digesting. There was a lot of buildup. And then it happened and suddenly Thanksgiving is over. There was a lot of work, a lot of planning, a lot of preparation and prayer and travel and all the rest that went into Thanksgiving. In fact, I read last week about a woman who went to the grocery store and was in the frozen section looking at the turkeys, trying to find one large enough for her whole family. 
She wasn't having success, and the stock boy came by, and she said, Excuse me, do, you, do these birds get any bigger? He said, No, ma'am, they're dead. <laughs> I read of another woman who called a hotline set up to help people prepare their Thanksgiving turkeys. I had no idea there was such a thing. Maybe there isn't anymore. Maybe that was yesteryears. But she called the hotline and asked them, can you tell me, she said to the operator, can you tell me how long it will take to prepare my turkey? And the operator on the other end of the line said, well, well you have to tell me, how, how much does your bird weigh? She said, I don't know, it's still running around outside. <laughs> <laughs> Thanksgiving lunch could be a while. <laughs> but that one reminds me of something said by a gentleman whose name you may recognize, David Letterman. He once shared, when I was a kid in Indiana, we thought it would be fun to get a turkey a year ahead of time and feed it for the following Thanksgiving. But by the time Thanksgiving came around, we sort of thought of the turkey as a pet. So we ate the dog. <laughs> Only kidding. <laughs> it was the cat. <laughs> Strange things go into Thanksgiving. And we in our family, we, we had a wonderful turkey that never had a mother. <laughs> Toe furkey or something along those lines. But it seems we just pushed away from the table. The meal is still digested. And it's over. Thanksgiving is gone. Makes me realize that there are two groups of people in the world. As I ponder and think about Thanksgiving, I realize there are only two groups. Now, you might expect that since we're in church, I would say, well, the two groups of people that we have in the world are the wicked and the righteous. That's what we would expect here. But no, that's not the two groups I'm thinking of, even though there may be some here who could give us some names of who belongs on which side of that line. Or you may say, two groups in the world, okay, well, you must be talking about the Republicans and the Democrats. No, I'm not talking about that either. Even though we hear about that, it seems, all the time anymore. Just two groups in the world. Well, maybe you'll say, maybe you're talking about the haves and the have-nots. After all, we hear a lot about that these days. Well, I'm not even talking about the haves and the have-nots. And in fact, on a university campus, I'm not even talking about the educated and the uneducated. None of those. But I still would affirm there are only two groups of people in the world. In fact, you can draw a fairly distinct line down the middle and know who belongs on which side. These two groups defy all other kinds of groupings. In other words, they're not respective of nation, tribe, language, kindred, tongue, or people. They're not respective of, of, of whether or not you happen to be a man or a woman, whether or not you happen to have socioeconomic status that is high or low, or any other marker by which we tend to identify people. The two groups of people I'm talking about are simply this, the grateful and the ungrateful. And the line of distinction that runs down the middle dividing them is whether or not they can, with heartfelt emotion, say, thank you. The grateful and the ungrateful. Now, Thanksgiving Day, Thanksgiving season, we all kind of join one side of that line, don't we? We're all ready to say, I'm part of the grateful, but then we push away from the table, we take a nap and wake up, and it's church. It's already two days past. Thanksgiving is over for another year. Or is it? Now, the Bible has a lot to say about thanksgiving and gratitude or the lack thereof. In fact, the Bible tells stories, gives examples of people who fit into both categories. The Bible talks about people who are ungrateful. The Bible even talks about the grateful, and imagine this, even commands us to give thanks. It's a directive in the Bible. Now, we can understand that, any of us who either remember our own childhood or who have been parents, because there's something we heard said to us, something we repeated to our kids in the attempt to teach them to be grateful. You know how it happens. You're there with your child, and somebody does something kind or nice for your child, and the person is standing there, and you look down at your child, and you say, what do you say? 
What do you say? What do you say to the nice man? What do you say to the kind woman? You're wanting to prompt them, to teach them, to help them to learn to be grateful. The Bible does that sort of thing. In fact, we could go to quite a range of passages to find such. I'm going to go to one today in the New Testament in the writings of the Apostle Paul. 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, we're going to read a very brief paragraph. Now, Paul is in the section of this letter where he is giving brief and punchy and pregnant phrases of direction to his Thessalonian readers. He's telling them, because you are disciples of Jesus, because you follow him, this is how you are to live your lives. And he does it in this context. He's going to give directions, which I want to suggest to you, that the passage we read today is for mature audiences only. Mature audiences only. You'll understand when we read it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with verse 16, says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's for mature audiences only. I first thought of it that way because I heard my predecessor, Dr. William Lovelace, one day quote St. Augustine saying that gratitude is the mature emotion. You must have a certain level of emotional and spiritual maturity to be grateful. But I find that true in everything that Paul says in these verses. He says, rejoice always. Only the mature can do that. Pray continually, that's for mature people only. Give thanks in all circumstances. It is certainly not the immature who can do that. It's for mature audiences only. Now, I want you to notice words are important, especially sometimes little words. Notice that Paul does not say, give thanks for all circumstances. Rather, he says, give thanks in all circumstances circumstances. Thanksgiving is past. And then I come to Paul and I read that I ought to be expressing gratitude, appreciation, and thanksgiving as a routine of my daily life. Whatever the circumstances are that I face. And that's challenging, quite honestly. That's not easy for me to consider doing. I wonder, in fact, what that would look like if somebody were to live a life that was characterized by that kind of attitude. What would it look like? It could be that it would look like Ed Dobson. Ed Dobson was a senior pastor of a mega church and stepped down. He was facing something very grave, something very grim. Ed Dobson had been diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, a degenerative disease that had a certain end. And he was now wrestling and grappling in his own life, not only with the pain and the difficulty of what he was facing, but also with a finite future. He was also wrestling with commands like this one, give thanks in all circumstances. How am I supposed to do that? He asked. And I'm asking, what would that look like if somebody did it? In 2012, Dobson wrote a bit about what he was facing, and I want to read you his words. He says, There are many things for which I am not grateful. I can no longer button the buttons on my shirt. I can no longer put on a heavy jacket. I can no longer raise my right hand above my head. I can no longer write. I can no longer eat with my right hand. I eat with my left hand, and now even that is becoming a challenge. And over time, all of these challenges will get worse and worse. So what in the world do I have to be grateful for? So much, he says. Lord, thank you for waking me up this morning. 
Lord, thank you that I can turn over in my bed. Lord, thank you that I can still get out of bed. Lord, thank you that I can walk to the bathroom. Lord, thank you that I can still brush my teeth. Lord, thank you that I can still eat breakfast. Lord, thank you that I can still dress myself. Lord, thank you that I can still drive my car. Lord, thank you that I can still walk. Lord, thank you that I can still talk. And the list goes on and on. I have learned in my journey with ALS to focus on what I can do, not on what I can't do. I have learned to be grateful for the small things in my life and for the many things I can still do. I want to be honest with you. When I read Dobson's words, I think, I don't know how in the world I would ever have that kind of emotional and spiritual maturity to follow a passage that's for mature audiences only to follow it by looking at all the circumstances of life and realizing that some are truly bad and evil, and yet there are still some good ones, and I will thank God for the good ones, is truly a wonder to me. But maybe that's what it looks like. Maybe that's what it looks like when somebody's Thanksgiving is not a day but a way of living life. I read Paul's words, in all circumstances, give thanks. And I wonder, well, what would it look like to do that? Maybe it looks like Ed Dobson. Or maybe it looks like another gentleman. He's going gray. He's a little bit stooped. But we can see him as we watch He's on the eastern coast of Florida. It's late afternoon on a Friday. He is slowly making his way toward a broken down pier. He carries in his hand a large bucket. We will soon learn that it's a large bucket filled with shrimp. As he gets closer and closer to the broken down pier, the seagulls begin to gather. They fly all around above him calling out their cries, almost deafening sound, because they've learned over the years what this means. This man is coming to feed them, stooped, graying, but faithful. This man's name is Eddie. Eddie, though if we had been able to speak to him, we would want to speak to him with a proper degree of respect. We would have called him Captain Eddie Rickenbacker. You see, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker had been part of a crew on a B-17 bomber in 1942. World War II was raging. Captain Rickenbacker and his crew were winging their way toward New Guinea. They were winging their way toward a meeting with General Douglas MacArthur. But then somewhere over the vastness that is the South Pacific, they had wandered off course. And as they got off course, they finally lost radio contact. And in their attempts to try to reestablish radio contact to figure out where they were, they watched that fuel gauge indicator slowly go dry. Crash landed in the ocean. Biggest raft they had was nine by five feet. The biggest sharks they saw were 10 feet long that would ram their crafts they quickly discovered they had many enemies, such as the scorching sun that blazed overhead, the raging thirst that was only slaked when the rains fell. But they soon learned that maybe their fiercest opponent was hunger, soon to become starvation. How would they survive? I want to read to you an incident that then took place, and I want to read it in Captain Eddie's words. Cherry, he says, Cherry was the B-17 pilot, Captain William Cherry. Describing this moment, he says, Cherry read the service that afternoon, and we finished with a prayer for deliverance and a hymn of praise. <laughs> Imagine that, singing a hymn of praise, Lost in the Pacific. There was some talk, but it tapered off in the oppressive heat. 
With my hat pulled down over my eyes to keep out some of the glare, I dozed off. And then something landed on my head. I knew it was a seagull. I don't know how I knew. I just knew. Everyone else knew too. No one said a word, but peering out from under my hat brim without moving my head, I could see the expression on their faces. They were staring at that gull. That gull meant food. If I could catch it. Now I read to you the words of the author, Paul Arant, as he described what happens next. And the rest, says Arant, as they say, is history. Captain Eddie caught the gull. Its flesh was eaten. Its intestines were used for bait to catch fish. The survivors were sustained and their hopes renewed because a lone seagull, uncharacteristically hundreds of miles from land, offered itself as a sacrifice. You know now that Captain Eddie made it because of the seagull. But now you also know, writes Arant, that Captain Eddie never forgot. Because every Friday evening about sunset, until his death in 1973, on a lonely stretch along the eastern Florida seacoast, you could see an old man walking, white-haired, bushy-eyebrowed, slightly bent. His bucket filled with shrimp was to feed the gulls, to remember that one gull which on a day long past, gave itself without struggle like manna in the wilderness. Decades later, still feeding the gulls as a way of saying thank you. Maybe that's what it looks like to read Paul's dictum, his directive to the Thessalonian believers, in all circumstances, give thanks. Not for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. Maybe that's what it looks like. An old man who never forgets and who says, despite the fact it is decades ago, there's no relationship between the two, I will do something that expresses my gratitude. I read this passage, and I think it's for mature audiences only. The immature need not attempt. There is a depth expressed in this kind of life, and it makes me wonder, what does it look like? When people live this out, well, maybe it looks like William Steiger. William Steiger was seated in a cafe that morning so many years ago. It was the very early 1930s. Steiger was seated there with several of his friends around a table. They were talking. They were struggling. The world was caught in a stranglehold of depression. They talked about what was happening around them. Rich people whose riches were gone leaping to their deaths the joblessness rates that just continued to climb, people not knowing where their next meal was coming from. Things were truly grim, and they were bemoaning the reality that they faced. When one of them spoke up, he was a minister. He spoke up, and he said, you've got to help me. Here in a couple of weeks, I'm supposed to be preaching a Thanksgiving sermon. What in the world am I going to say? I have nothing to say. Look at our country. What can I possibly say? Steiger said, It was in that moment that I'm convinced that the Spirit of God gave me a thought, placed a thought in my mind. It was very simple. Here was the thought, he said, just like that it came to me. In the midst of all the dire circumstances, the terrible situation, just say thank you to someone who has blessed your life. Just say thank you. So Steiger took that thought in. He thought, that's what I'll do. As he thought about it, an image came to mind. It was a teacher from many years before. 
He realized that she was the one who, through her teaching, had woven into the fabric of his life a love for English verse, a love for poetry, a love for English literature. So Steiger that day sat down and wrote a letter to this teacher from so many years before. He said it was mere days. He had an answer back. He opened it and the letter said, My dear Willie, and by the way, he said, when I read that, my heart was warmed. I was in my mid-50s, had been bald for years. Nobody called me Willie anymore. He said, I read, My dear Willie, I can't tell you how much your note meant to me. I'm in my 80s, living alone in a small room, cooking my own meals, lonely, and like the last leaf of autumn lingering behind. Then listen to this sentence. You'll be interested to know that I taught in school for more than 50 years, and yours is the first note of appreciation I ever received. It came on a blue, cold morning, and it cheered me as nothing has done in many years. Steiger says, I'm not sentimental, but I found myself weeping over that note. It stirred his thinking. And then he thought of a bishop who had been very gracious, very kind, very wise in his counsel, had offered him his love and support many years before as Steiger was getting started in life. And so he sat down and he pinned a letter to the bishop saying, thank you so much for the influence you've had on my life. Again, a few days later, another letter. It said, my dear Will, your letter was so beautiful, so real, that as I sat reading it in my study, tears fell from my eyes, tears of gratitude. Before I realized what I was doing, I rose from my chair and I called her name to share it with her forgetting that she's gone now. You'll never know how much your letter has warmed my spirit. I have been walking around in the glow of your letter all day long. The depression. The preacher. What am I going to say? And Steiger says, thank you. Just thank you to people who have influenced and blessed my life. And I come today reading, reading Paul's words to the Thessalonians where Paul says, in all circumstances, give thanks. And I think, how can you do that? And what would that even look like? If somebody were to take that seriously, how would they live it? Well, there are those who do take it seriously in the very grim and difficult circumstances of life. But then there are others who take it seriously, who have experienced blessing. One such person is a Hollywood star, a Hollywood A-lister, in fact, who just about two years ago, November of 2015, in speaking, are you ready for this, out of Hollywood, speaking to a church group, said the following. Give thanks for blessings every day. Every day. Embrace gratitude. Encourage others. It is impossible to be grateful and hateful at the same time. I pray that you put your slippers way under your bed at night so that when you wake in the morning, you have to start on your knees to find them. And while you're down there, say thank you. A bad attitude is like a flat tire. Until you change it, you're not going anywhere. Denzel Washington. What is his line? A bad attitude is like a flat tire. Until you change it, you're not going anywhere. So there you have it from, from the most dire of circumstances to the most blessed of situations. And everywhere in between, people living out the reality of Paul's words, in all things, all circumstances, give thanks. It just underlines for me there are two groups of people in the world. Just two. Those who are grateful and those who are ungrateful. Just two groups of people in the world. Those who celebrate Thanksgiving Day and those who celebrate Thanksgiving life. 
Two groups of people. Those who push away from the table and digest the food and say, well, that's done for another year. And those who push away from the table and say, this coming year is going to be a year when I will live a grateful life. I will take the apostle seriously in what he says, no matter what may come. I will hide my slippers deep under my bed so that every morning I'm on my knees and while I'm down there, I'm saying thank you, God. When you leave this service, send a text, send an email, make a phone call. Say thank you to a neighbor, to a roommate, to a colleague, to a friend. Say thank you to your family. Look them in the eyes and say, you have made my life worth living. And say thank you to God. Kneel before Jesus and say, Jesus, it is because of you, because of your grace. Were it not for grace, who knows where I would be. But because of your grace, I am here. Though life may be difficult or easy, I am experiencing the blessings of your hand. Say thank you. Don't just live Thanksgiving Day. Live Thanksgiving way. I read Paul's words and I wonder, what would that look like? You know what? I think we can provide the answer to that. We can, through this coming week, this coming month, this coming year, become a community that consistently expresses gratitude to one another and to God. That's what it will look like. Give thanks in all circumstances, says Paul, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So I guess there's just one question left. What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Amen. God of grace, that comes from the heart. Thank you for your love, your grace, your blessings. Thank you for your presence in our sorrows and struggles. Thank you for Jesus. Amen.
Hello, my good friends. It's Thanksgiving season, and I hope you have enjoyed it very much. Warmest blessings to all of you. And right at the top of my list today is Nathan Merkel, who lives right nearby at the villa. And I got to find out, dear Nathan, that it's your birthday, and I wish you the very, very best. Next on my list is Judy Whitehouse. Hello, Judy, longtime friend, and I'm so glad to be where you are whenever, and happy, happy birthday. Pastor Errol Lawrence up in Toronto. Pastor Lawrence is with the Toronto West Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I find out from somebody who really cares about you that this is your birthday about now. Happy birthday, Pastor Lawrence. Look at these two, Oswald and Joy Sutherland, who live over in Sebring, Florida. And I find out that you are marking 55 years of marriage. Warmest congratulations. You look beautiful and we congratulate you. Hello, Patty Catalano. Wow, are we so happy about you being around the Loma Linda University Church, leading at the gathering place? It's a special place to be and more special when you are there. And this is your birthday, Patty. All the best to you, your grandchildren, and Dick, that wonderful man with you. Miori Ito, hello Miori, there at the villa. Wonderful to greet you for your birthday this November as well. Jerry Hoyle. As I live and breathe, the Wedgwoods. And we think of you and we think of the others, and so we greet you, Jerry, for your birthday this November. Hello, Hervey Gimbel. Dr. Gimbel, you are so special to all of us and to so many people in China. We congratulate you, Dr. Hervey, for your birthday. Vienna Stone. Do you bring back memories? You and Bill are very special in our lives, and I'm happy to know it's your birthday, Vienna, and I wish you the very best this November. Mary Louise McDowell, also at the Villa. Hello, Mary Louise. Happy birthday to you, dear. And Jilda Roddy. Look at Jilda. We appreciate you, Jilda, and your ministry here at Loma Linda University Church. And we're all so happy to see you and that wonderful family of yours. All the best, Jilda. Noreen Nelson. Hello, Noreen. Do we have memories way back to Walla Walla days? And I wish you a very happy birthday and to see you there with that man in your life. Heather Smith. Way back Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I learned from a dear friend, Heather, that it's your birthday and I want to wish you the very best. Marjorie Dawson, Lyman, Maine. I'm told it's your 91st birthday, Marjorie, and I am so pleased to get to greet you this November with happy birthday. Hello, Ken Walters. Betsy tells me you folks have lots of history too, and she learned it's your birthday, and so I get to wish you a very warm greeting this November. Jesse Orser, bless your heart, Jesse. Here you are coming on 93, is it? And I'm thinking you and Mel are so special in the lives of many of us, and I wish you, Jesse, a happy birthday. Hello, Susie Potts. Always glad to be where you are. And I think I'm going to get to see you a little bit later because my dental appointment is coming up. Happy birthday to dear Susie as we see her with a granddaughter and with husband Mike. Patty Hammerly, so glad to see you from Sabbath to Sabbath when I can. And 
A dear friend said, don't forget Patty's birthday. So I'm remembering Patty. Happy birthday, dear. Fred Self. Hello, Fred. We know you are a special part of many lives, and that includes us. And so I'm happy to wish you a very warm birthday greeting. Lanita Medina. I chose these pictures because teacher that you are, you're always creative and helping people with art. So bless your heart. Happy birthday, Lanita. And Ronald Carter. I thought there's no more familiar image of you than carrying the mace. And another is being with a grandchild. Happy birthday, Ron Carter. And Lawrence Suffolk, out Banning Way. I'm told you are marking 99 birthdays. Happy birthday, Lawrence. And finally, Ruth Vitrano Merkel over in Ultawa, Tennessee. Hello, Ruth. Dear friends reminded me to be sure and greet Ruth. So happy birthday and warm best blessings to all of you. <laughs>